Well, good afternoon, everybody, and, um, and welcome to this, this webinar by Dr. Dominic Ohuli. And I have to say, it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce Dom. Um, certainly people in the UK will be well familiar with Dom. He's known for um, having a very logical mind, for being a straight talker, for being pra pragmatic. And I suppose above all of that, he's, he's just a really a lateral thinker. Um, and Dom is just a mine of information on so many things. He's got the literature at his fingertips um, and just an amazing, amazing brain. So Dom has, um, he's been a dentist for 27 years now um, and 25 of those 27 years he's been doing implants. So he's got a tremendous um, affinity for and understanding of implantology, of uh, the mechanics, of biology, and all of the bits that, that need to go together for, uh, to make long lasting treatments. Um, so Dom, as a, as a trusted and a really good friend, fellow trooper, um, I'm just delighted and thank you for agreeing to do this, this talk for us. Absolutely, uh, Steve. I must say, before I hand over to you, Dom, one of the most inspirational, probably, I think it was five or six hours of my life, um, you know, from a, from a, um, a scientific perspective, was driving yourself and Stephen Chu to Manchester from Edinburgh during the roadshow. So I had the privilege of spending that whole week with Dom and Stephen Chu and two great minds that honestly just didn't switch off. And I was driving and they didn't stop speaking from the time we got into the car until the time we got out. After the thing, they got a train from there to London and they still didn't stop speaking until this morning. Mm -hmm. I was and the conversations were brilliant. They challenged each other's thinking as good scientists do and good clinicians do. Um, and they've become great friends. And, and Dr. Stephen Chu has got a huge respect for you, Dom, as we, as we all do. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to you. And thanks again. Thank you, Steve. Well, thanks to everybody for um, breaking into your day today to, to listen to me. Um, really, the purpose of this webinar today is to try and take us for an hour or two at least away from the blooming COVID situation and just try and reflect back on better times in some ways when we were luckily enough to be placing our implants and enjoying using the technology to its best advantage. So what I'm trying to do here is really show you how I've pushed the envelope with the inverter implant. The inverter itself, um, to me, makes perfect logical sense in so many different ways. And so what I'm trying to do here is just go through a set of cases for you. This isn't going to be a webinar that's particularly based around papers, loads of slides on different papers. We can all get those and there's plenty of information regarding that. What I'd prefer to do today is really dig into some cases and try and give you an understanding of my thought process as we go, go along. So just with that in mind, um, a bit of a disclaimer, I haven't got any financial links to Southern Implants at all uh, or to Ethos Regeneration Limited, the alloplastic material I tend to use quite a lot. So I'm not here for that reason. I'm here because to me, the Southern Implant, implant catalogue, the, the range of implants available has allowed me to do two things really on on one level it's allowed me to expand my own personal implant practice and on the second level it's allowed me to meet some other individuals and we just mentioned Stephen Chu for example who have really expanded my own thinking um, I don't think there's another implant company like Southern in the world um, engineering driven from the very top um, and hopefully you'll, uh, as we go through this, you'll be able to see some of my thought processes as we, uh, as we go through the cases. So, so I, what, what, who am I anyway, apart from being somebody who made a rather bad choice with hairstyles um, uh, about a couple of weeks ago when a, one of my uh, sons shaved my head for me. Uh, I'm a dentist, I've got a special interest in implants, I've been in the UK inverter beta trial group. So I was very lucky and fortunate to be involved in that. Treating patients before the general release of the inverter implant in the UK. Um, it's been a delightful time for me to uh, not only do 
cases with the implant, but at the same time, actually start to laterally think about what are the limits of this implant and how can I facilitate my patients to have treatments that are going to be predictable, uh, optimally successful, but at the same time, perhaps reduce the number of visits that I'm doing for those patients and reducing the morbidity of uh, multiple surgeries. I've tended to adopt a bit of a protocol here while I'm using a, um, the inverter implant with an alloplast material ethos. Uh, I'm trying to synergize two different technological advances here. Um, personally, my own uh, implant practice, I've moved very much away from using xenografts or uh, allograft materials. Um, and in the last probably eight or nine years now, I've been using almost entirely um, Alaplas. Um, and I felt when I started thinking a little bit more about inverter, I felt that the in the uh, cylindrical, in the uh, chimney portion at the top, the, the narrow portion of the implant, I was really thinking, well, how can I really benefit that jump gap there? And instead of the normal um, jump gap, mainly on the labial, we obviously have that circumferential jump gap. And how could I best manage that? And for me, I felt that the alloplast material would provide me with a tried and tested way to really double up the benefits. So I'm going to present a few cases here. Uh, there's a range of techniques. Some of them you might agree with and some of them you might not. And the good news today is you're going to get a chance to ask me questions at the end. I'm going to try and give you my honest opinion on all the, uh, on all the cases. I'm sure you're going to find things that you might find, um, I'm not sure I agree with that. And if you do, please challenge me. I need challenging. All right, so case one, we're going to start with a case that's uh, close to my heart. What I want you to do here is think a little bit about who could I have chosen for case one? <laughs> my first case with inverter. And I've ended up choosing my own son, Gabriel. And you might think, wow, you know, why do that on, uh, as a trial for an implant? And the, and the reason is I've, and this is, this is really important, I wanted for Gabriel, who's 22 years old, a young man in his prime, I wanted to do the very best treatment I could for him. The very best. I didn't want to use second best. I didn't want to use something where I thought, hmm, long-term stability of this may be inappropriate. I wanted to use something where my logical mind was telling me, I'm giving this chap, my son, my lovely boy, the best chance for a long-term stable optimally successful outcome pink aesthetic score white aesthetic score the fact he's a good looking lad and he's got to go forward with his life smiling at the ladies all the rest of it and i want him to have the best advantage for that so that's why inverter was the obvious choice so here we have him a big grin uh, upper left front tooth he was over in liverpool he's doing chemistry there and unfortunately uh, he came to the assistance of somebody who was getting assaulted and the person who was doing the assault then turned around and punched Gabriel right in the mouth and fractured his upper left central incisor off at gingival level, uh, just above gingival level, uh, but also it's unfortunately one of those fishtail fractures that's fractured right down under the palatal gingiva and actually subcrestal to the uh, palatal crest as well. So originally with Gabriel, he was still growing. So when this happened a couple of years ago, and my feeling was I wanted to postpone doing implants if possible. And I'm so glad I did. Uh, what I did first was I root treated the tooth for him. And I used his crown, his, his actual tooth, I stuck it back on as a temporary measure. Um, so I had a hopeless prognosis. I waited until he was 22 and I thought he's the ideal candidate for this first inverter. He's a non-smoker, he's a healthy person, doesn't drink that much for saying he's a student. <laughs> he's got pretty good oral hygiene um, and I just thought ideal candidate. So as you can see here, when I repositioned the tooth, it was slightly labial to what it originally was. And if you look carefully, you'll see that gingiva there is slightly inflamed on the palatal which is um, where the sub-gingival margin is of my re-cemented 
tooth. Looking at a cross-sectional CT image of it, it's interesting to see that it does have a labial plate intact. 1.2 millimeters there, my rough estimate using the, the guide on the CT scanner. You can see, if you look carefully at this image, you can actually see how the, the fracture tracks down on the palatal side, and we have lost some bone height on the palatal there. At the same time, we've got a nice thick palatal gingiva, and we've got the root filling. If you look carefully on the buckle, you'll see that we've actually got a little bit of bone loss uh, on the labial side of the root tip there with a thinning of the labial plate. <clears throat> looking at the uh, sagittal uh, CT scan now, you can see from looking from below, we can see we've got a nice well-formed incisive foramen. We've got some scatter from the root filling material. And again, you can see this little bit of bone loss buckle to the apical third of the root. So we've got the intact labial plate. And for me, this was an ideal opportunity to place an inverter implant. The reason for that is that the interradicular distance between the central incisor and its companion on the right, also the left lateral incisor was appropriate to place an implant of the required size to allow me to restore it predictably. We took the tooth out. If you look carefully at the tooth there, you'll see that that soft tissue, that granulation tissue, tracking down that the anterior portion of the root there towards the tip, and also some on the side as well. Um, the try to take the tooth out as atraumatically as humanly possible, because one thing that's really important here with any immediate implant placement is we want to try and have an intact socket. What we don't want to do is damage the socket during the extraction process all the soft tissues. Now I think it's really important on this first case to be aware that even though it was my own son Gabriel, I still managed to damage his soft tissues a little bit here. So you'll see that and you'll see what happened with that. Okay, so we've got the socket and you can see where I've nibbled his soft tissues, unfortunately, front and back here. That was despite my best intentions at taking the tooth out, it still happened. I've got an intact socket. Uh, the, the socket was verified using uh, a CPITN probe, a BPE probe, to ensure that the bone was present on the labial plate. Um, this, is, this is Gabriel now actually having his implant preparation. So the first thing, and it's so important to do in these cases, is to degranulate that socket very carefully. It's not appropriate to think that you can just degranulate by using your curette, scrape around the socket and think, well, that, that'll do. One of the things with any immediate implant placement, in my view, is that poor degranulation, leaving granulation tissue present, can lead to an unpredictable outcome. In the worst case scenario, your granulation tissue can replace your grafting material, you can end up with poor bone formation around your implant, and you can end up with a really suboptimal outcome just for spending a little bit longer with your degranulation techniques. Now for me, I like degranulation burrs. So I don't just, what I, what I don't do is I don't just use my sharp cure, I actually use a burr as well. Use the burr, we're then at the position now to place the implant. So the inverter is a really, really nice implant drill kit. It's fairly simple. The drills have long shanks and allow you to get a very steady drill rotation. You haven't got any jitter with the drill. It isn't uh, juddering around. It allows you to be very pinpoint accurate with your implant placement when you're trying to do your osteotomy. What I've done here is I've placed the osteotomy to allow me to place a coaxis inverter implant. It's got a 12 degree coaxis angle on it. So therefore what I want to do is I want to place the implant so that the screw access is through the cingulum position on the central incisor. And that means that I'm going to be placing that implant in this type of class one ridge situation down the middle of the ridge. And it's what I do. So there's the implant in place. You look carefully there, you'll see that the inverter uh, implant is placed centrally down the ridge there. We've got the little dot on the labial side allowing me to gauge exactly where the 
uh, coaxis angulation is. If that dot was on the palatal, for example, the angle would be the wrong way around for this case. So you want that dot just right. And you want to make sure when you're doing this that you are accurate with your positioning, not only uh, macroscopically between your two roots, uh, labiopalatally, but also that your rotation of your implant is just right as well. Because if you think about it, your screw axis position on your um, on your um, palatal portion of the crown will be dependent on that uh, coaxis um, screw hole being in exactly the right orientation. And you need to be careful about that. So here we used a peak temporary cylinder. There's a circumferential jump gap. And what we've done here is we've placed alloplast material and instead of your normal jump gap, mainly towards the labial, uh, because you've tended to, with a straight implant, you've tended to have to place it palatally, the body of the implant palatally, to allow you to have that screw axis in the right place. With your coaxis, what you're able to do is place that implant lovely right down the middle of the ridge, but still get your palatal access for your screw hole. And here you can see that quite clearly. We've got the peak cylinder um, polymer material. It's nice and easy to use for single units. I've been able to place the Ethos Alloplast uh, circumferentially. And we're now ready to think about the more restorative side of this implant placement for Gabriel. Okay, so not going through all the case, all the, the different stages on this particular case, I'll go through them on another case. But what I've done here is I've uh, had a lab made provisional crown made, made by my colleague, Phil Reddington, who works upstairs in, in his laboratory, one of the finest ceramists in the UK. Um, and he made me a beautiful lab made provisional crown, a shell crown. What I've been able to do is pick that up using uh, composite and then actually replace it and screw it into the inverter implant. And what it does show me here, and it's, it's a bit unfortunate, is it shows me where I've traumatized the gingiva. You know, and what should I do? Not sure this case because of that. I think it's really important to see this. This shows that every aspect of implant placement, uh, immediate implant placement is vital and soft tissue, preserv preserving the soft tissue, being very careful with the soft tissue is part of that. And I failed to do that though. Could have been nerves at treating my own boy, but you know. So anyway, let's have a look. Placement day, here we go. Um, we can see now what I was talking about. We've got that perfect implant position down the center of the ridge. Uh, we've got a really fairly incredible amount of uh, labial width there. We've got a combination of the alloplastic graft down the original socket. You can see that quite clearly there and the combination of the original labial buckle plate. So you've got that 3.1 millimeters there to the uh, uh, shoulder of the implant. If you look carefully on this slide, you can then see the actual screw. And we're right down the middle of the implant here. You can tell that by looking at where the screw, central channel is on the screw. And you can see that 12 degree angulation there. And that's then allowing me to place the, the, the screw axis on the palatal side of this tooth in this class one incisive uh, relationship. So after a couple of weeks, uh, Gabriel was back in Liverpool. Um, so he's uh, back being a student again, doing what students do. Um, cleaning fairly well, to be honest with you. And uh, interestingly, after two weeks, we can see the initial healing here. We can see where the trauma was. Um, it's healing really nicely. We can see these papillae uh, are stable. We haven't had that papillae shrink back at all, whatsoever. Uh, and this is early days, so uh, very pleased. I was really pleased when I got this photograph from him. I'm afraid the photograph was taken by one of his uh, flatmates who's a medical student uh, with their camera phone in the front garden of their house. So they hadn't took a bad photo really, but it's, uh, it was pleasing for me to get that. And this was prior to the lockdown, obviously. So here we have it after eight weeks. Now have a look at that again. So what we're getting now is we're, we'll look at his right central first. Look at this lovely uh, orange stippled keratinized gingiva. And we've got similar on the other side on his, on his lovely provisional crown. And we've got that 
mature in Healy Insight now, and, and very interestingly, look at look at where that gingival margin is. Look at where his papillae are, and uh, look at the absolute precision of that uh, that result at eight weeks. Delighted with that. Now, one thing that I would say is I'd love to present further reviews here, but I'm afraid that COVID's really prevented that. Um, his flatmates now locked down away from the uh, away from Gabriel, so Gabriel's no longer got the opportunity to get high quality photographs. So he's stuck in Liverpool, working from home. Uh, while I'm over in Leeds, um, but as soon, one thing I guarantee is, as soon as this is the lockdown starts going off, I'm going to make sure that this case is very carefully and really in detail updated, and I want to do that over a long period of time because I think it's a really good case. So just to show you eight weeks, we've got a just a PA here. Um, we've got a PA showing the. Uh, uh, ethos, the alloplast material already changing into bone. You can see where it's doing that there and there in the original socket shape. And we can see we've got a nice ideal outcome here with regard to uh, with regard to this uh, this inverter implant. We can see the narrow coronal shoulder of the implant allowing plenty of interradicular bone distance between that and the other roots. We can see that that's allowing it what we call endosteum so what is endosteum? Endosteum is bone that contains marrow. It's allowing that bone with marrow to support the papillae on either side of this crown. And that's one of the key differentiating features of this implant. The traditional implant that was perhaps another millimeter wide here, we've got a reduction in bone width. We've got a, bit, a reduction in the labial plate width. And we've got less likelihood of having that endosteal bone there could have just a cortical plate, then reliant on blood supply from the outside of that, from the periosteal membrane. We're not relying on that blood supply on the inside from the endosteal marrow space. And for me, it makes perfect logical sense, and discuss this in detail with Steve Chu, makes perfect logical sense that your stability of your labial plate is compromised by that reduction in, bone supply, in blood supply. Okay, so let's look at case two. This is where we're moving from, you could call it a fairly straightforward inverter case in the aesthetic zone, to one in a, that's a little bit more complex in several ways. Still in the aesthetic zone, it's in a much older gentleman, um, a great guy. Um, and this case is really to illustrate the first, my first kind of, lateral thinking exercise in pushing the boundary of this implant so we'll go through it and see what you can see what you guys think all right so this this chap um well preserved teeth for a guy in his 70s uh good gingival health he's got a failing upper left central again this time it's a failing post crown it's uh been refixed numerous times uh the root's got a fracture and I'm afraid we're now at a position where it's uh, it's had it, and it, there's no predictable way of restoring that tooth. Okay. Looking at it from the side, it's been re-cemented by his own dentist a few times. We've got extra cement there. We've got it. You can see it's slightly labially placed now. It's also extremely vulnerable to coming out again. You can also see his oral hygiene could be a little bit better as well in this slide. So let's look at let's look at his ridge form. So we've got the tooth, let's have a look at it. Absolutely kaput. You can see that we've got the crown of the tooth now placed as well as it could be, but it's not central on the root. The root itself is failing. The post within the root um, appears now to have, have perforated towards the apical third on the palate side. We've got a bony, an issue with the bone there on the, on the uh, palatal as well. But with plenty of bone height above the implant, above the uh, root rather, to his nasal floor. So this is to me again an interesting case where inverter is an option for me. And this is where it gets complicated. When we start looking at this from here, I've actually put this on the slide. Oops. What we can see is we've got a fairly large area of granulation tissue we assume 
we've got a, a radiological bony radiolucency on the palatal side of this tooth of the upper left one and it's communicating with a fairly large incisor frame so what first what came first here was it the chicken or was it the egg was it the incisor frame and has communicated with the back of the tooth or far more likely in my view is it the fact that the back of the tooth has got a cystic or a granulation type lesion on it and has that then eroded the bone into the wall of the incisor foramen and left us with this quite unusual and quite interesting bony deficiency here. Now I still felt inverter was a possibility here. However, just to be sure, I also had a rochette bridge, just in case. I think it's always important if you're doing cases where you are pushing the envelope, that you've got a way to be able to deal with it if you can't do what your primary treatment modality was and I think that's important. So here we go, I've taken the tooth out as atraumatically as I can, I seem to have done a better job this time than I did on Gabriel. Um, uh, what we can see here, if you look carefully, we've got this large area of granulation tissue has been left in place after the tooth's come out and here it is. So that's me really trying to illustrate i'm showing you now it's a fairly large juicy looking piece of granulation tissue it's come up from the, the mesiopalatal portion of this socket the rest of the socket is intact however the mesiopalatal portion of the socket has got a direct communication with the incisive foramen now studies would tell us that damage to the incisive foramen by trauma during implant placement can occasionally lead to uh, either paresthesia anesthesia or alternatively uh, altered sensation which can be resolved as pain a patient can have long-term chronic pain from damage to the incisive frame from the nerve bundle within that so i think this was a uh, within my mind as i was thinking about this case i'm quite happy to remove the granulation tissue but i really didn't want to start traumatizing that incisive frame if i could help it and yet i still wanted to place an inverter implant Okay, so I, was try, I feel, you know, we were trying to do something a little bit more advanced here. So anyway, I've took the cystic granulatory tissue away. Um, and then it's really a case of going to the granulation, degranulation procedure. I mentioned in the previous case that I like these burrs. They're made by Ethos and they're, uh, it's really quite a rough burr that's used with good water spray, uh, it's got really rough pieces of diamond on it. And it's exceptionally good at clearing that granulation tissue away. You need to use it with care. You don't want to be pressing really hard with this particular drill. Uh, and there's four sizes of it. So you're trying to use the one that's appropriate for the case or use more than one. But I think you'll be surprised when you use it, just how much more granulation tissue you'll get away. You think that you've cleaned a socket out effectively with your sharp curettes. Have a go with one of them after and just see what comes out and you'll find that you've still got granulation tissue on that and that's telling you something it's telling you that careful degranulation down to clean bleeding bone gives you in my opinion gives you the opportunity for the perfect environment for your implant placement okay so degranulations occurred now we can see quite clearly here we've got a connection with the incisor frame and here what's not apparent on this slide um because it were bleeding is uh, there's actually still granulation tissue in this kind of channel this tunnel that's being created and it needed removing as well now this was with great care because what we don't want to do is stick the drill right into the incisive frame and take out the nerve bundle so i didn't do that <coughs> excuse me what i did was very carefully removed loosened this plug of tissue from that bony canal before it meets the main incisor foramen and then remove it with a sharp curette and uh, there it is. Okay so this case I'm going to try and show you the drills a little bit more. This is the first drill that I tend to use, the Lance drill for inverter. It's a great drill. Um, what's good about this drill? One, it's got a long shank that allows you to get great stability with the drill. So therefore, when you're placing the drill and you're using the drill, 
it's not attached to a drill extender with, with that little bit of lateral play. That lateral play on a drill extender creates a little bit of juddering with your drill. And the last thing you want when you're trying to be absolutely perfectly accurate with your placement is that. Now, I'm not a guy who uses guided very much at all. I tend to use, the, the only guided I use is my eyes and my brain. So for me, it's really important to have that binocular vision, good access, good lighting, a really good drill that's really firm, secure, it's not juddering about. And I can see exactly where I'm placing that initial osteotomy to allow me to get a perfect position for my implant. And you can do it with this. So you can get your position right, and that's key. And if you haven't got your position right, you need to move your move your osteotomy to get your position right. Don't just keep drilling away. You must, it's really important when you're using any immediate implant is that you ascertain that you're still exactly in the right position between drills. Don't just keep going and then find out that you're off. Actually, it's far better to just each revisit, reflect, look at how you're going, really carefully analyze and take the drill out of the handpiece for goodness sake place the drill into the osteotomy and look where it's emerging from the socket it's a very good way to ensure that you're actually correct in your positioning so we've done the drilling sequence now and we're now ready to place the inverter for me by far the most common inverter i'm using on a day-to-day -day basis or was until the lockdown is a 4.513 so 4.5 at the widest portion of the implant, and then narrowing down to 3.5. Uh, 13 millimeters long, uh, usually a coaxis as well, not in all these cases, but in most. Um, coaxis for me is the one of the great generational shifts in implant technology. Um, if you haven't used it, say you don't use Southern, or you've never used a coaxis, for goodness sake, use one start using them it's so much better it's a logical way to really really take things forward with you know instead of using for example angle screw screw corrections so angle correcting screws which were those awful screwdrivers that you just think oh any minute i'm going to strip the screw head and the other thing is that because there's so many different available you've got four or five different screwdrivers in your kit oh what are we doing without it why not just let's go back to first principles and let's have an angle correction within the implant itself. That's, that's I think, the logical way forward. So anyway, so we're, we're looking at the implant I'm tending to use the most here. Uh, and we're looking at how I placed it. So I'm looking at several different things here. This is the carrier that's specific to the coaxis inverter implant. And this carries uh, it's a few things, a few little technical hints here. It's placed at a factory setting. It's fairly low. It's a bit tighter than it used to be, but it's, 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 it needs tightening. When you're placing an inverter implant, one of the key things you will find, one of the great things you will find, is that it will crank up to a lovely high torque. And that ability for it to go from fairly low in the immediate insertion torque so that beautifully high torque in a really, it, it's almost, it's, it's, it's a great implant for somebody who loves to feel their implants going in. If, you, if you're one of these dentists who actually really enjoys the, and you want that tactile sensitivity as you place your implant, there's no better implant than the inverter because you can feel it crank up into, the, into that lovely high torque that gives you the confidence that during your primary stability reduction over the first few weeks of placement, so that stability dip prior to the secondary stability, that you're still going to have enough stability with that implant to predictably be successful with immediate loading. So I'm often getting 85 to 95, even 100 newton centimeters here with these implants. Um, what's important is that the with the coaxis, I'm, in, I'm emerging on the incisal edge of the other central incisor. Unless obviously he's got a flared incisal edge position, you've got to you've got to really use your wits and make sure that you're not just arbitrarily doing that. But you're thinking logically. You want the screw position to come out cingulum on the palatal of the incisive crown. So therefore, you want to make sure 
that your inverter implant coaxis is coming out at the incisal edge. That gives you that 12 degrees automatically. From this picture, you can see very clearly where the stripe is on the actual carrier. And that's another way to indicate that you've got the correct rotation of your implant. You want your implant three to four millimeters subcrestal as well. You don't want the implant placed on the crest. You want to place it subcrestally, being aware that you've got that fantastic chimney portion of the implant, narrow portion of the implant that allows you to have that um, endosteal bone and really good blood supply from both the periosteal ligament and the endosteal bone to preserve your papillae and also pre preserve your labial plate. So here we go. So moving forward, something you're going to need to look carefully at here, we've got the uh, initial position now of the implant. Look quite carefully. Hmm, perhaps I haven't quite got it just right. If you look carefully at the dot there, it's perhaps not absolutely perfectly central in that ridge. It's not far off, but it's not perfect. Second thing, have a healing abutment ready. Put a healing abutment in. And what I'm able to see here is we can see how I've placed the implant very carefully to a high torque. And yet we can see that there's still visibility of that incisive foramen connection visible on the mesiopalatal of this socket. We've got a large jump gap. You can see that. You, you can't on this slide see that there's a small palatal jump gap as well. So here we go. So alloplast used again. Uh, alloplast build, healing abutment prevents alloplast going down the implant. Um, so place healing abutment. Um, this alloplast build has allowed me to place alloplast not only into the labial jump gap, but also into the defect into the incisive foramen. I haven't cleaned up here, so you, this slide's a bit messy, but it gives you a very indi good indication. This particular alloplastic material forms a pseudomembrane due to calcium sulfate, and it forms its sets. And when it's set, you can take your healing abutment off. And one of the later slides in today's presentation will show you how that works. So here we go. Um, talking a little bit about the importance of that rotational position of your implant. It's really important that you get it bob on. You don't want it two degrees off. You want it absolutely spot on. And I wasn't spot on here. And if you think about it, if I'd have turned that another three or four degrees, another couple of millimeters but less, if I'd have turned it to here, we'd have then had that emergence on the palette coming right in the middle. It'd have been perfect. So, you know, when you're looking at your cases, reflect on your cases and see what you could have done better. And this is a case where I could have done that better. You may think, well, you know, so what? It's no big deal. But it is actually, it's important. Try to achieve perfection with everything you do. Here we go. Um, another beautiful provisional crown from Phil Reddington upstairs. It's amazing having a lab upstairs. Um, fully recommend it. It's, I'm very lucky to have that. Um, is it's been polished. It's important to get a nice polished emergence for several reasons. You want the correct emergence to support your soft tissues labula support your papilla with the right amount of pressure and second and the other thing is you want it highly polished because you don't want a plaque retention factor in that site at all here we've used the peak abutment again which is my go-to abutment i like the emergence on the on the peak abutment it's got that two millimeter emergence which is uh, i find that fluted emergence is is appropriate for my cases and here we see from now from the on the left of the slide, the palatal view, and we can see we've got the uh, peak cylinder there. And then from the front here, you can see that it's a nice looking temper. It's not absolutely bob on with regard to colour, but it's a temper. It's pretty good. Um, the main thing is it's allowing me now to uh, really predictably give this patient appearance, function, and optimised gingival outcome. And that's what I want. And here's the, I suppose you could call it a money shot. Um, it's, a, it's a damn good illustration of, of the various scientific concepts involved in this technique that we're using. So we're using an inverter implant, an inverter implant with a narrow chimney portion towards the coronal. It's giving plenty of room for a really juicy, thick buckle plate. 
3.3 millimeters all the way down to the middle of the implant and at the tip of the implant 4.7 millimeters a thinner palatal wall of bone by all means however we've got a thick palatal uh, gingiva there and we've got no issues with palatal stability with the bone there I don't think again when you take when you're doing this yourself and you're taking these CTs make sure that you if you do a cross-section and you're looking for this that you've got the center of the screw so you're getting a really true accurate position of the CT you can see the alloplast here down the front of the socket um, and then we'll we'll start to have a look now to to see the repair that we've achieved so uh, Casting your minds back to one of the slides near the beginning of this second case where I put oops, you'll notice we had that large penetration into the incisive foramen. Here we can see that that's now got ethos uh, alloplast in there and we've got a nicely positioned uh, apical portion of that inverter implant and a large ethos build on the, on the buckle as well. And there he is at six weeks. Um, What's really interesting here is that we've actually had a uh, coronal movement of his gingiva, even compared to where it was on his original crown. Um, we've got stability of his papilla, um, and he's now functioning with this tooth. Uh, obviously, in the first weeks after placement, this tooth must be free in occlusion and in excursions, and the patient must be very clear that they're not allowed to chew on the tooth and bite on the tooth. And you need a patient who can follow your advice with regard to that. It's no point having a patient who says, oh, okay, and then goes home and tries to eat um, a crusty bread cake the minute they get home. You've got to have a patient who you feel is going to be compliant if you're going to do an immediate implant case. Because if they start chewing on it when they get home, it doesn't matter what implant it is, you've got a higher chance of immediate failure. Looking at the uh, labial soft tissue here at six weeks, you can see we've got really entirely preserved label soft tissue very pleased indeed got this slightly flatter appearance on this temporary crown um which obviously won't be mimicked in the final crown where i'll i'll use the final crown to actually further enhance this emergence what i might do is i might use this one and uh, modify it as part of the process of getting ready for the final final crown right so we've so far today, we've looked at two cases, upper left central incisors. So we're in a position now where we're going to start looking at something a little bit more out of the box. And this is where I started dreaming about inverter. So I was thinking about inverter quite a lot when I wasn't placing them. I was thinking, wow, we're here now in a position where I've got something that's really giving me some more tools in the box here. And then something happened that, that made me think, well, actually, is this a case for an inverter? And I thought, absolutely it is. And I'd like to thank uh, Riz, uh, one of my colleagues here, who, when I was up in uh, Scotland uh, at a Southern meeting, we had a little chat about this case, and I was brainstorming with him, just saying, well, you know, what do you think? And uh, he agreed with me. I think that this, is, this was a really good opportunity to use inverter for, for perhaps a new and less used treatment mo modality. That's what I've done here. So this uh, elderly lady, great patient of mine, um, had an implant placed about nine years before, uh, up, upper left lateral incisor, upper right lateral incisor with a four unit bridge. These are not southern implants. Um, they were placed, uh, been stable. She's been for regular reviews. She's had regular periapical radiographs. She's had, um, I tend to probe my implants and there'd been no increased probing depths. She had no signs of periimplantitis or perimucositis, no other warning signs that this was going to happen. Now, tragically, just before Christmas, last Christmas, uh, she had a, a really awful personal tragedy happened. And um, she started, she, she became aware herself that she started clenching at night. This, she wasn't somebody who, who had a Brooks, Brooksism or Brooksomania type habit, but she started doing that and waking up with a really tense jaw and a feeling that she'd been clenching. She didn't ring me and tell me about this until, unfortunately, one morning she woke up and not only did she have the feeling of the tight jaw, but she also had 
a very tender uh, bridge at one side at the front. And as you can see here, we've got a circumferential bone loss around the implant. It's not a, it's not that wide apple bite phenomenon that you see in peri-implantitis. It's, it's basically a loss of integration, a narrow loss of integration around that implant. And it's happened very quickly. So here we see it uh, in the mouth. This lady's an elderly lady in her in in late 70s. Uh, this bridge was doing great. Um, here we can see that there's evidence there of something going on. It doesn't look right there. She's been avoiding it with cleaning, obviously. It's been tender. She's been trying not to bite on it. And here we see we took the bridge off and we've got a multi-unit abutments at both sides. We've, we've got the appearance of something going on here. Um, there's something not quite right here at all. Um, and this happened, as I say, this happened in the days before Christmas. Labs weren't open. Had very little opportunity. What do I do here? I couldn't get a denture made for her. What do I do? What would you do? So what I decided to do was I decided to just let's see what Inverter can do here. So what I did was as follows really. I took the implant out. And the implant came out by derotation. I didn't have to use an implant removal tool to explant the implant. It came out simply. There was no separation whatsoever. It just came out. And then we basically, we had a socket, we had an implant socket, and we had to make sure that implant socket was intact. If the socket was intact, that allowed me to then consider, well, can I use an inverter here? And can I immediately load this bridge here? Am I taking it too far or not? And I didn't think I was. So the implant came out, as you can see, it's lost its integration, a um, bit of soft tissue on it towards the coronal, but apart from that, it's just a, no real burn on that anymore. Um, and you know, again, I'm coming back to this, will that socket be intact? Because that's important. Degranulated here with the degranulation burrs and you know, you can see the kind of stuff we're getting out with the burr. Um, use your sharp cure as much as you want, you'll still get more of this stuff coming out. And it's important here particularly that we're cleaning all this granulation tissue away, this thin membranous layer between the failed implant and the bone needs to go whatever implant you're gonna use. So luckily I did have an, an intact socket. So the labial side of the socket, the whole socket was intact. And here it is, lovely and clean. So we've got this more tubular socket, tubular uh, tapered socket, which is the equivalent of what the implant was before. We can see the top of the socket there, and then we've got the soft tissues. Uh, and for me, logically, tell me why I can't use an inverter, because there isn't a reason in my view. I think a coaxis as well. So to, to try and actually place, rather than down the original, uh, rather, because it was a straight implant originally, I placed that implant in such a way that the coronal portion of the implant was emerging palatally. So what I wanted to do with an inverter was I wanted to try and utilize that lovely bone further down where this narrow tapered portion of the original implant was to get me as much stability as I could. So a coaxis for me was again, a good option here. So here we go, prepped, coaxis placed, position absolutely right, just again. You'll notice the difference here is there really isn't a jump gap. And the reason there isn't a jump gap is because it was a 3.3 .3 implant uh, and we're placing a 3.5, 4.5 inverter. So we're not, you know, in this case, there isn't a jump gap or much of a jump gap. Uh, in the distance there, you can see the other multi-unit abutment from the other side of the bridge. It's a good, uh, this is a good illustration of angles to allow me, you know, you can really see how I've, how I've been able to uh, place the inverter in the appropriate position here. Stability I achieved with this was really high. I've got, from memory, we're looking at 85, 90 plus. So it's not just angles that have to be right, it's the lines that have to be right. You, you want this to be right as well. You don't want this coming out here or here. You want it coming out in just the right place at the right depth um, to allow you then to, to predictably restore this implant 
um, in the right way. So, okay, we haven't got much of a jump gap, but we did have some jump gaps, so therefore I did use Alloplast again. Place my healing abutment as before. Uh, the healing abutment's a tapered healing abutment, with um, uh, then allows me to then place the alloplast down the mainly in this case down the labial, a little bit down the palatal as well, uh, just to really enhance that soft tissue outcome that I wanted to see. Um, this time, because it was a bridge, I decided to use a titanium temporary cylinder. Um, the advantage of that, I think, is it's very strong. The disadvantage for me at the time is it's one millimeter emergence profile on it. It's not the end of the world. Um, but I, as I say, in this case, I decided to use it for this length for, for unit bridge. I decided to use it. Um, that's this slide il illustrates the magic of coaxis for me. So, what you've got here is you've got that implant coming out just right within the bony ridge just right but you've still got that emergence of that um, screw hole coming out exactly where you want it on the palatal of this bridge so you haven't got your tip of your implant yet you've got your apex of your implant sticking out the labial which sometimes with a with a straight implant that's your worry that you're actually perforating labial here and you're not with this implant use care use attention make sure your drill processes are followed carefully reflect on your drill position all the way through ensure that your osteotomy is in exactly the right place and if you do that and you use your coaxis you'll find that you'll be able to keep your implant within the bony ridge and at the same time have your screw hole in the right place for screw retained without having to use one of these rubbish angle correction screws so here we go uh, pick up and polish uh, Again, you can see here, there's a slightly different emergence on this tie cylinder. Uh, polished chair side, and uh, you can see the connection on the other side to the multi-unit abutment. So, and here it is placed. So, just to be a bit cheesy for a moment, a Christmas present worth having. I felt very sorry for her, a, lot of, a very tragic event in her life at the time. And the last thing I wanted was for her to either have no teeth at Christmas or, or a something that i tried to cobble together at the surgery what i wanted to do was to try and give her a fixed solution and i managed to do that here and yes you can tell i've been working here of course you can but at the same time we've given her a fixed solution she's a sensible lady and she's not going to start chewing fruit gums on that bridge on day one so logically again the inverter has been the logical choice to allow this patient to move forward in a fixed way over a, a very difficult time of year. And you can see the position here. So we've got the screw retained on the other side down the multi-unit abutment. And on the on our other side, you can now see how I've uh, managed to achieve a nice access screw position there. And you can see we've gone from that failed implant there to that lovely inverter implant. The inverter implants play slightly subcrestal. You can see a little bit of alloplast uh, material there. Uh, as I said, I preferred a longer emergence on the uh, on the cylinder, but here we go. Um, you can see that I've managed to place the inverter just up, just up to the nasal floor, not quite into that cortical plate there. And here we go um, at six weeks, at a review, solid as a rock, starting to eat normally, light food. Gums coming back. The ginger was coming back nicely. Now, what I would say is I'd love to be able to show you some more photos of this case, but we're in lockdown. And I do feel at this time, oh, you know, that's a bit disappointing for the all you lovely people who are on this webinar. And what I what I'm going to promise you all is that these cases I'm showing today, I'm going to ensure that all of them I get the longer term follow-up photographs for you all at a later date. And that's, that's my promise to you because it's all very well seeing this at six weeks, but you need to see it at six months and you need to see it at a year and longer than that. All right, so we've now looked at three cases in the upper jaw. We've looked at a simple case, simple in inverted commas. We've looked at a complex case and we've looked at a case where it's almost been a secondary usage for the implant where we've rescued a situation with a failed implant. It's not its primary modality, but it's another 
exceptionally good way to use the inverter implant. Now we're moving to a case four. We're going to move to the mandible. And this is one that you might immediately think, oh, well, this is immediately the, the, the case for an inverter. Often in the lower anterior part of the, uh, of the mouth, you're thinking about interridicular space for immediates. And in many cases, even a three millimeter implant isn't narrow enough to allow you to place a predictable immediate implant for a single tooth in the lower incisor position with enough space between that implant and the roots to ensure that you've got an adequate blood supply. So I think this is an unusual case insofar as that it had a long-term loss of a, one of his incisors, so he only had three lower incisors in a four-tooth burnished space. And that created that almost window of opportunity for this inverter implant placement here. So it's unusual insofar as, yes, he's got the, uh, the three teeth rather than the four, uh, the canines here and here. He's got this failing uh, incisor that has not only had a root filling done to it, it's then been apisectomized using amalgam. It's been re apisectomized using amalgam again. It's had a post placed, it's had a new post crown placed. The second post has perforated measly. And so the tooth is absolutely kaput. There's no way that this tooth can be predictably restored and needs to come out. And again, the old Dominic Hooley lateral thinking was coming into play. The guy absolutely refused to have a denture. He refused to have a temporary bridge. He wanted an immediate solution if possible. He obviously was aware that a temporary bridge may have had to happen here, but he really wanted to go for something immediate, an immediate placement, an immediate load if he could. And, you know, he's fully consented. We discussed this in great detail. He's a bright chap. He understood the concepts. And for me, I made the decision that I think an inverter was appropriate treatment modality for him. Again. So here we go. So we'll, we'll look at his ridge, looking at this preoperative CT cross-sectional scan. 6.6 millimeters. You can see the position of the failing tooth. You can see there doesn't appear to be a buckle plate there. Uh, if there is one, it's very thin. You can't see it on the CT. Um, you can see a few other features of this ridge. In fact, it's it's fairly parallel sided. And then he's got this axis of this palatal vessel, this, sorry, this lingual vessel coming in here. Um, so this is, this is about as narrow as you can get, really, to use any immediate implant, I think, really. Uh, I made him a rochette, just in case. But I wanted to wanted to use an inverter here. So this is the situation. You can see this is the tooth here. This this uh, photograph from above. Looking at his two canines here and here. Looking at his three lower incisors. Looking at the scar. This is important. Let's have a look at his scar here. You've got a scar. Fixed tissue profile. This keratinized tissue here is fixed down onto a scar on the bone. Um, you can see this failing tooth here, uh, and what you can see as well is that there doesn't be, there's no apparent sign of any buccal uh, inflammation or sinus or anything going on there. And now we look more directly down the long axis of the tooth, and you can see that scar quite clearly there. And you can see what I tend to find with these is these scars tend to tell me something. They're telling me something. If that scar's tied down like that. What does it tell me? It tells me in some cases you're going to have really, really firm fibrous connection to the bone. And in a lot of cases, you'll find you've actually got a bony, almost pseudo dehiscence. It's like a, a notch in the bone full of fibrous scar tissue. And that's important. And you'll see that later in this particular case, because it actually affected the treatment here for me quite fundamentally. So here we go, looking at the scar again from the front and looking at the position of the tooth, uh, looking at the root forms on the its adjacent neighbours there and seeing how they both appear to flare away, giving us plenty of interdicular room to be thinking about uh, an immediate implant, an inverter. Going back to the previous slide, you remember that the uh, labiolingual bony ridge is about as thin as you want to be thinking about to be doing any immediate implant really. 6.6 millimetres, parallel sided, uh, 
you're really going to struggle to expand the anterior mandible using versadrills or anything else. You're not going to do it very predictably at all. So here we go. We'll take the tooth out uh, in bits. Took, took a lot of getting out, actually. Um, if we look at this root portion here, you'll see that it's got an amalgam uh, retrograde root filling in the apicectomized portion of the root. Um, I still remember taking that out, actually. It was surprisingly difficult to take out. And here we have the socket. Back to uh, degranulation. Again, I use the degranulation burr. It's a routine, absolutely rigorous part of my implant placement procedures. Uh, I noticed there was stubborn granulation tissue near that scar. And I also, when I finished doing degranulation, I was well aware here that we had a very thin labial plate. It was there, but it was really thin. And you might think, well, how can you tell? And I, you can tell. I think you can tell. If you use the instrument, you can feel it flexing. You can tell. I felt it was appropriate to raise a flap. And I think that's, again, you've got to, when you're doing cases such as this, when you're pushing the envelope a little bit, be aware that your primary treatment modality, oh, I'm going to go in immediate. I'm going to be flapless. No, you're not. You're going to be prepared to go flapped if you have to. And if you're not prepared for that, you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Have it in your mind that your primary treatment may well progress into a very different treatment and be able to do that. Have the equipment and materials available to be able to change your treatment if you need to. So here we do. We've, we've opened a flap now, so we've done a fairly big flap, really. Um, and we can see we've got the bony ridge here. Uh, one of my little arrows here to show you this scar and it's quite interesting so you can see scar you can see where I've managed to reflect the flap away from the scar but what, what's interesting is we've got this plug of material possibly from the original socket that was there and it's granulation tissue that's managed to form this decent and it's not exactly where I want to put my implant anyway it's slightly to the left of where I want to put the implant but it still shouldn't be left so we need to remove that And there it is again. So you can see it still, but what I've done here is I've started to prepare the site for the implant now. And, and as you can see very clearly here, we're through the cortical plate and we're into that lovely cancellous burn, that trabecular burn. You see the trabecular burn here. You can see I haven't really got much of a, a labial plate anymore. Um, but what I'm thinking about here is I'm thinking about the novel attributes of the inverter implant again. So I'm thinking about the fact that the inverter implant not only has the narrow chimney portion in this area to allow me to have plenty of burn between the roots and in the labial portion, but it also has this nice fat central portion with those quite aggressive threads that allow me to get high primary stability. And that doesn't mean I need to have a circumferential burny socket to do that. We've got a mesial wall and we've got a distal wall of burn here. We've also got the palatal wall and my view as long as I could keep that implant within the bony envelope, is that it was an appropriate case still to immediately load. And here we go. So the implant's now been placed. Very high primary stability, with 80 plus Newton centimetres primary stability there. I've placed it perhaps maybe a millimetre deeper than I would have liked in, in an ideal world. I'm happy with it. Um, what's interesting is this this wide portion of the implant is still within this buccal wall. So if you drew across this or placed a, placed a, a probe across this, you wouldn't be touching this implant. It's still, it's still inside this original bony envelope. And yet the implant has achieved high stability without having that labial plate there. And the position of the implant, again, is ideal to be allow, allow me to place a screw, screw retained solution with the screw coming out on the lingual here. So again, we're using the coaxis, the most fantastic invention. And here we go. What we've done here now is with a very different alloplastic buildup. So we've placed the uh, healing abutment, the tapered healing abutment again, to protect the internal screw of the implant. We've then placed the alloplast material, more of it. So we've placed it to re form the labial plate here in, in alloplast. We've also placed it 
wider than the initial dehiscence um, and it's been allowed to set into its pseudomembrane type state it takes approximately five minutes there and it's it's nicely set uh, and this illustrates where the implant is compared to the original bony wall so it's, it's nicely placed it's not too labial so again we 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 get a provisional made again it's been made upstairs phil reddington coming to give me another lovely temporary temporary crown and again i'm gone back to a single unit i'm using a peak abutment with a nice two millimeter emergence a nice fluid emergence so that we get a nice well contoured well polished provisional crown that allows me then to place that into the right position uh, I use um, PTFE sutures, the four rows here. Um, PTFE is a nice suture material uh, because it's monofilament that doesn't tend to harbour plaque. You tend to not get that plucky kind of uh, suture hole inflammation that you get with some uh, braided materials. Um, it's not resolvable, so you have to remove it. Well, it's not a problem at all. One thing I would say about PTF is it's uh, you need to modify your uh, surgeon's knot to ensure that you don't get it undoing itself. It's Teflon so it's therefore it wants to undo so don't let it undo. Um, put an extra uh, surgeon's turn on it to give it that extra stability of that, um, that uh, suture. The other thing I would say about these sutures is if you leave them a little bit longer, you'll find they can bury themselves a little bit and they're a little bit difficult to take out. So be aware of that and be, be aware that you may be taking them out even less than a week. And here it is, the crown in place um, with the nice access for the screw. Um, and you can see what we were talking about originally. We've got these flared root forms, and we've got the inverter placed nice and central here with the crown in the correct position. We've got the uh, alloplast material, I suppose, visible a little bit on this x ray. Um, I think it would have been great in a case if we, you know, in the future, it'd be lovely if we had a really narrow XX version of the inverter. And I'm sure that's something that's. Uh, a lot of you are probably thinking about as well. It's uh, such a great implant. If we could have a narrow XX. And the reason I say XX is because I'm well aware that once you start getting very narrow with a deep conical, you've got wall thicknesses to think about here and uh, strength of the coronal portion. And yes, we're well aware we're using absolutely superb cold worked grade four titanium, but you still got to make sure you've got a minimum strength and you want to over engineer this portion of the implant. So therefore for me, logically an XX version that's narrower seems to make sense. So here's the baseline CT and um, you can see the alloplast material here, 2.2 millimeters here. So the implant is in the right position here. Um, not an easy placement, we've got this very, very thick, hard cortical plate on the, uh, on the label, on the lingual, sorry. But again, really happy with that emergence. You can use, you know, again, we've used the coaxis implant and it's allowed me to get that screw retained solution in, in a challenging case. Uh, it may not look particularly challenging to some of you guys, but it was a challenging case. Um, and a couple of weeks in and we can see we start got initial healing and I'd love to again to have uh, further, further x-rays, uh, sorry, further um, photographs for you, but I'm afraid I can't do that. The guy, he's in his 70s and he's actually, he's got to self-isolate even more than the rest of us at the moment. Okay, so I hope you're all still with me. I know I can talk the hind leg off a donkey, but um, I'm just going to go through three more cases now, really. All right, so we're going to, this next case is just back to, back to a little bit more simple, we're looking at a, an upper anterior case again. The difference here is it's a lateral incisor. Now, when you're thinking of doing your first inverter implant in the aesthetic zone, for me, don't do a lateral first. Do a central. The central's a larger socket. You've got a bit more room. I think you've also got a little bit more interdicular space between the central and its partners. So it's lateral and it's other central. 
you've obviously got the entire framing to worry about, but you, you, you're going to be well aware of that and you're going to have pre-planned the case properly to, to, to know what you're doing there. I think a lateral incise is a bit more challenging. It's challenging because you, you're dealing with a smaller root form. You're dealing with a more overt root form and a narrow space into ridiculously between the central incisor and the canine. So therefore, when you're placing your implant here, you have to be absolutely spot on. It's very easy to end up tracking off one way or the other and ending up with a suboptimal outcome. And I think you should bear that in mind. Not your first case, but by all means do it. And again, we preoperative x-ray having a look at this central incisor, sorry, central incisor and canine, the failing lateral incisor, uh, the crown's failed, uh, failing root filling, the post crown, uh, it's a fiber post, you can't really see it very clearly on there at all, but there's a root fracture as well. And we've got an apical area as well. So it's kaput and it needs to go. Um, Let's get ready for the treatment. So again, one of these beautiful tempers from my colleague upstairs. Um, seems to make sense to me to get things ready. So I know I'm going to use a peak abutment, peak, peak cylinder, sorry. And I want it to come out of the right place. So I'm not going to, maybe I've chanced my arm a bit here, but I, th I thought let's, let's get it ready before we start. Let's get it right. So he's got a thick biotype. Um, if you believe in biotypes, he's got plenty of keratinized gingiva there. Um, fairly little lip line. It's not massive with aesthetic concern, this one, but it's uh, the guy's got, he wants something immediate. Uh, if you look at the original crown, it's quite a bulky old crown. Um, which suggests there's probably a slightly uh, politely placed root form and it's been pat padded out here to give him a correct position. It's obviously a non aesthetic looking thing. Uh, look at the uh, labial gingiva. Um, and just be aware this is this is where we are at the beginning of this case now. All right. So we took the tooth out, and if you remember back to your original x-ray, you'll remember there was a granuloma apically. It's always nice for us dentists when we take the root out and it comes out with it. And that doesn't mean you don't need to degranulate. What it means is that you've had the main bit of degranulation done for you. But you still need to degranulate. Don't just think, oh, well, that'll be clean. No, it won't. You need to degranulate. And as I say, for me, using the drills is a part of the experience now it's got to happen so I've degranulated it's an intact socket and we've gone through the drill process as usual with the inverted drills and it's allowed me then to uh, place my implant in the right position so it's what have I done here specifically I think it's really important to be aware that when you when you're doing your in, inverted drill protocol you start with your lance drill, then you're going through your coloured drills to uh, allow you to get the appropriate drill sequence to get your appropriate osteotomy. One of the things that I've found I can do is slightly under length them occasionally, but I wouldn't recommend that. I think that the consensus among experienced places of inverter is that you should really drill to length. And that's similar to most immediate implants, really. But what you can do is you can undersize your drill. And I would recommend you think about that very clearly and very carefully. This implant isn't an implant for a beginner. It's an implant for somebody who's experienced. And you should be already au okay fait with feeling the bone and understanding the quality of the bone. You need to feel it. You need to understand, yeah, you've got your CT. Yeah, you've took your tooth out. Yeah, you felt your socket. But what do you really feel with that bone? And that'll give you an understanding of whether you want to drill to size or whether you want to undersize. And it'll make you understand of where you want to undersize to. Do you want your final drill to actually not go to full length, but just to undersize part of the way down? So be aware of that. Whatever you do, don't just do one protocol for every single case. You need to be aware 
that this is a technically sensitive implant and you need to be aware that you need to know the bone, feel the bone to ensure that when you place your implant, you can achieve that necessary primary stability. And it's so easy to do with inverter. So I placed it. So we've got a circumferential jump gap again. That's one of the advantages. Again, of using a coaxis implant. It's down the middle of the ridge. And that means that I've got a space labially and I've also got a space mesiodistally and palatally. I've placed alloplastic material. It's set. Um, the healing button was placed first to protect the threads of the implant. And we'll wait for setting in normally about five minutes. No more than that. And there we, this is a good slide. It's a, call it a money shot. It's, it's really, you've took the healing button off and you can see you've got your alloplast fully set. You've got your implant in its correct position. Um, and you're ready to then do the restorative phase of this treatment. Sorry, I just flipped two slides. So here we can see now what, what we've managed to do. So we've placed the implant in the right position. So it's the 3D correct position. It's the right depth. It's the right mesiodistal location compared to the two roots. It's the right labiopalatal position. And the coaxis allows the screw position. So the screw axis hole to come out in the right place on the provisional crown. All those things sound complicated. And if you haven't used coaxis, it, it can be a bit of a mind bender. Don't let it be. If you're going to use inverter, coaxis will be something you use a great deal. So before you use inverter, use some normal coaxis implants first to get, your hang, get the hang of them. One or two in and you'll start to understand it. It's once you get the once you understand it, it becomes something that you start thinking, gosh, why didn't I have this for my whole implant career? So here we are, we've got the peak cylinder again coming out on the palatal side. It's almost where that amalgam is on the other lateral incisor. And here we have the pickup using composite material, polished to achieve a nice emergence. We've got the nice fluid emergence on the peak cylinder with its hex connection to the implant. And here it is placed. So this is a millisecond or two after placement, a few minutes after placement. And you can see we've got that exposed alloplast material here. Uh, we've got the uh, correct location for this tooth and it's quite a good color match. Um, if you go back to the original slide, you see you didn't have a filled pillar here anyway. So that's, that's where we were with that. And if we look at this now, you can go back to the uh, original slide and you can see the position and size of the tooth there, of this crown that had failed. And here's afterwards. And if anything, there's a little bit of uh, expansion of that, but I think it's the angle of the photograph. But it's, uh, it shows you the nice position of your screw axis hole and the, the little bit of alloplast material that's just visible and I expect that for this particular material, which is a beta tricalcium phosphate with a calcium sulfate binder, I expect epith epithelialization of that material very quickly. So what I'm expecting is for the body's epithelium, for the body's skin cells, gingival cells, to pass across that material quickly and it'll be covered in epithelium before you know it. It's also a bacteriostatic material and I found that very helpful because it's perhaps a little bit pushing the envelope again to leave this material exposed like that. And so here we see, we, this going back to the original discussion I had on the lateral incisor, how important it is that you're very careful with your positioning. Some lateral, there's a lot of lateral incisors brush close to the canine and you need to be aware of that. You don't want to be placing this implant in such a way that you end up with the implant actually touching the touching the adjacent tooth. You've got the big advantage here, it's widest portion, it's 4.5 millimeters, and then it narrows down to 3.5. And you can see that you've got that plenty of space there into ridiculously for that endosteum bone to form to give you papilla stability. And at the same time, you've got that juicy jump gap to give you that lovely endosteum there to help you with that double blood supply, the blood supply from the endosteum that marrow bone and your blood supply from your periosteal, uh, peri uh, periosteum. So unlike a 
an implant, a normal tapered implant, where you've perhaps only got just thin cortical plate laid in, you've actually got the endostin as well. Okay, so at six weeks, uh, again, these are short-term reviews, I'm afraid, and it's the nature of the beast with COVID and with the release of this implant, but here we go. Uh, and you can, I think the things you can see here is a really lovely uh, tissue response at six weeks. Patients able to function normally on this tooth now. The pill is exactly the same as it was before, and we haven't lost any here either. It'd be some form of miracle if I gained any, but we've definitely not lost any. Um, and again, I'm going to come back to these cases. So uh, watch, watch, and hopefully you'll you'll get the benefit from when I come back with these and they show you longer term reviews. You're going to. It's my absolute guarantee to you that that is one of the things I'm going to do here is uh, my watchword will be long-term review on these cases. All right, so we're, we've looked at some cases so far that have, that have been, I think, have, have shown a kind of a, a logical progression of the use of, a, of an implant that can achieve high primary stability and can be placed to allow an appropriate access for screws and things like that. But here's a case where I've really, it's been multiple factors that have taken me outside the comfort zone of this, of any implant placement, but I still felt it was an appropriate one to do. And you'll have to follow my logic here about why, it, why I felt that. And you'll also see where I've made a mistake here and where with the benefit of hindsight, I would have perhaps chosen a slightly different inverter implant than I did. But here we go. So what's happened here, this chap's had an implant placed it's about seven or eight years ago and it was placed by me. Um, lovely guy, lovely guy. Um, but not the greatest set of teeth in the world. And I'm afraid his, his lower right canine, his lower right first premolar, had reached the end of the lives. Uh, the lower right first premolar, uh, post crown, root filling, slight radiolucency at the end of the tooth. We've also got a root fracture about midway down the root and loss of the uh, bone mesial to the root, uh, coronally to that root fracture. The canine mm, got possibly a pal on the tip of the root. And at the end of the day, it's a tooth that's looking a little bit dubious in the long term too. The coronal seal of the crown that's there is, is fairly poor, uh, which should fit in with that apical area on the root. Um, and again, it's, you know, if I'm taking the four out, what am I going to do? Leave that three? His lateral incisors is okay, as are all his lower incisors. So for me, I think it was a case of let's, let's think of a solution here where these two teeth of dubious prognosis, one of hopeless prognosis and one of dubious prognosis are taken out and we think of a way forward. And again, it was inverted that I started thinking about. And here it was a case of using the inverter implant for one end of a bridge again. But this time, rather than a failed implant at the other end, we were going to actually take a tooth out and place an inverter implant against a non-southern implant as the two abutments of a bridge. But at the same time, we were going to do that in the mandible. Hmm. And we were going to do it in a chap who's got good burn but a narrow long tall ridge okay so when you see the ridge now the cross section you can see that yeah it's so tall that it looks super narrow it isn't that narrow really it's just the fact it's got such a tall thin ridge uh, what you can see is there's very little burn there on the labial uh, and near this uh, first premolar uh, and I'd argue that mm, could he have a decent here? The burn seems to be back here. But what you what you tend to find with CTs is cone boom CTs that you cannot always see the burn. So sometimes you'll take these teeth out and you'll feel that there's still burn there. It's perhaps it's paper thin, but it's there. So it's not always the case that you'll see this appearance on CT and you'll think, oh well, well, that means there definitely isn't any bone there. Other things to be aware of here at this stage of planning is that he's got a lingual cortical plate here that's thick, solid, very little sign of any trabecular, trabecular bone on the inside of that, of that first premolar at all. 
So pre-planning again. So here I've used uh, an appropriate four in one abutment for the implant that was placed seven or eight years ago by me. Uh, so that's, that's for that one coming out in the right place here. Here, uh, I decided looking at the ridge that I needed to use a straight inverter and that's, I think the mistake. And I think that with hindsight, I wish I'd used a coaxis, but I didn't and we live and learn. But anyway, this is the pre-planning and this is where I've uh, got the bridge ready. It's another nice little temporary bridge made by Phil upstairs. Um, and we're ready to go. So the pre-op, I'm afraid the photographs, uh, not to my normal standard, is I'm afraid a new nurse who's getting used to the camera. So I apologize for that. Um, what you can still see is though that you've got the lower incisors, you've got the canine, which we talked about having a dubious long-term prognosis. And we talked about the first premolar, we're having a hopeless prognosis. We can see on the buccal there, we've got a sinus, um, and that tooth, uh, you know, that, that's a, another indication this tooth has really uh, got poor prognosis. Also, I wouldn't really want to be putting an immediate implant directly there either. See behind it, we can see the second premolar, we can see the screw access channel, it's an old one. Uh, you can see it's, uh, we've got screw access there to allow us to take that implant crown off to allow me to make this bridge. So anyway, that's a, another photograph. It's a bit better quality showing this chronic sinus here. There weren't any pus coming out of it, but it was obviously there was something going on at the base of this root here, slightly to the mesial, which is, you can see that with the x-ray before. So we take the crown off. Take the crown off. That crown's been there for seven years. So you can see a nice mature gum collar there. Um, that's the connect, hex connection of this particular brand of implant. And then we've taken the two teeth out. Um, going back, reflecting on that CT scan, you can remember that both of the teeth were quite long and narrow. And I was quite pleased that we managed to get them both out as atraumatically as I did, particularly the canine. What's apparent though, is that the buccal plate was missing, <coughs> as we fully expected, at the premolar. Uh, and also a little bit dubious at the canine as well, thin and flexible. What I did was we, the other brand of implant placed a healing abutment. And the reason I did that is to protect that implant during the next phases of treatment. You don't want to leave it open to the oral environment or to if you're doing drilling and things like that and getting all sorts of rubbish down your implant. So make sure you cover it over. Degranulation, I know I keep going on about this. You're probably all sighing and saying, here it goes again. But I can't overemphasize this as part of the protocol. If you're doing any immediate implant, degranulate as carefully as you can. Confirmed I'd got a buccal fenestration here um, and it was time to raise a flap. Wow. So we've now moved from a circumstance where we had a, a fairly routine two extraction site to now quite a, quite a large flap. Uh, we've got the implant further back there and it, towards the front there we can see now the angulation you can see this large granuloma filled fenestration towards where the uh, premolar was um, but it needs cleaning up don't leave the site like that clean it up so degranulated the site again after the flap was raised and um, degranulation of the site then allowed me to really have a look and carefully see what I've got. Decided to sacrifice the bony ridge on the fore. Um, this little bony ridge, this little bony bridge that's there, probably go anyway. This one I decided to save it. And the reason I decided to save it is because it was vascular and it was bleeding. That suggests to me that it's got internal endosteum and it's probably going to be preserved. I could be wrong. What I also did is I started preparing the site, going back and reflecting very carefully here on my implant position. And this is where you need to reflect back yourselves to that earlier slide where we looked at that thick cortical plate on the lingual of this case. It's not easy to do this. When you're trying to prepare cortical plate, a thick cortical plate, you need to have 
a guide finger on your drill as well. You need to, when you drill in here, you need to make sure that your drill just doesn't scatter off, bounce off, and you end up drilling towards the labial. What you need to do is you need to have a lateral guide finger on your drill, and you need to ensure that your drill's running fast, good water irrigation, sharp, fresh drill, and you're actually drilling where you want to drill. Being aware, obviously, that you don't want to be highly aggressive and, and not controlled, you want to ensure that you're creating a channel down the lingual here to allow your implant emergence to be appropriate, but at the same time not ending up with a lingual perforation, which you really don't want to do. So it's again, it's about good hand-eye coordination, being aware beforehand of exactly what you want to achieve with this implant, and at the same time, going back to this, even though I've managed to achieve a channel here and create a good emergence, I'd have, even, I'd have been even better with a coaxis. You know, we should have done that now, but I didn't. So here we go. This is a straight inverter. It's again, we're looking at a 13 millimeter inverter, uh, 3.5 coronal portion, 4.5 middle of the, the tapered portion. Very high primary stability. And it's down that lingual slot to create a good emergence, but it's not as good as it could have been if I'd have used coaxis. So at the right depth, and again, you can uh, you can see on this case, you haven't got that um, coaxis specific shoulder with the, with the mark on it and the different width on the shoulder. You've got that regular shoulder on a straight implant. And if you look carefully, you can see the position of the distal one there again. So here we go, we've decided then 80 Newton centimetres plus primary torque. You can see how the central portion of the implant's biting into the bone again. It's within the bony envelope. You can see my thought process leaving that window and it's still got that lovely uh, jump gap behind it. It's a circumferential jump gap. Um, again, with hindsight, perhaps I should have polished the end of that off as well. Um, Put a healing abutment on. The reason I put a healing abutment on, we'll go through this again, is because I'm going to be using an alloplast material now. The alloplast material, you don't want it going down your implant. But again, hey ho, I wish I'd used a uh, coaxis. Right, so here we go. We've placed quite a lot of alloplast here. The build's in several different regions. So we've got Ridge preservation, I hate the word socket preservation. You're not preserving a socket, you're preserving a, a ridge. And uh, therefore I've placed into the degranulated socket, alloplast. Secondly, I've placed alloplast into the large fenestration uh, labial to the uh, implant, the inverter implant. And also generally in the area to, to achieve a little bit better soft tissue outline in this region, which is uh, slightly concave. We've closed again with PTFE sutures, um, my go-to suture, really. And here we have the bridge that I've pre-prepared. Uh, and then what I did was take the peak abutment out, take the four-in-one abutment out, place the two abutments on the two implants. So on the distal implant, the four-in-one abutment is made out of titanium with titanium nitride coating. And then on the front implant, the peak abutment. And here's the bridge then positioned um, into place. Problem with the four in one is it's not tall, so you've therefore got to be aware of that when you're uh, when you when you're cutting your access channel that you can actually get to the screw. But you can see here it'd be nice if this had been coming through a little bit more lingual, and that could have easily been achieved if we'd used the coaxis implant. And here we are. We've got the uh, bridge now uh, polished. I'm afraid it was done chair side in this case. Um, so it's not quite as finessed as normal. Uh, and then the bridge has been positioned. So you've got the original position of the three teeth and then you've got the bridge in position. You've got the previous implant in position with its healing abutment, the radiograph showing the two clear sockets. Um, and you can see if you look at the mesial socket, if you look at the four socket rather, you've got that lost bone mesial that we could see when the tooth was there. Here we've got the uh, ridge preservation procedure using, ether, uh, using the alloplast. Um, 
I'm not worried about it down here. I want it. I want it in this area particularly. We've got the uh, alloplast around the uh, jump gap on the inverter implant as well. And then you've got the temporary bridge in place and it's not showing up on the x-ray because of the material it's made out of. And then you can see the two very different contrasting implants and the amazing ability of this implant to give me that incredible primary stability that I want. Right, so we've gone through a lot of cases here. It's been a bit of a heavy session. Um, I hope you're still with me. I hope you aren't sick of a Yorkshire accent at this point. You probably never want to hear one again. But this final case is, uh, this was a challenging case. I've used this case to illustrate a lot of different things, really. Um, it's a challenging case for a number of reasons. And one of the reasons was patient compliance. This lovely patient lady uh, was unfortunately violently sick during the procedure. And it involved us going back to first principles, she had to be cleaned up, we had to go back to re-drape re, re the whole surgery. So this was a challenge for various reasons. However, it was also a very interesting case and it shows how I've used various different techniques together to achieve a good outcome for her. Now this lady was originally, she had a failed tooth and she was originally wanting, she was going on holiday for the holiday of a lifetime to Australia to meet her daughter and spend a month in Australia. And unfortunately with what's happened with the COVID lockdown, she hasn't ended up going. But the reason that we wanted to do an immediate placement here was primarily because uh, I felt it was appropriate to do so. And secondly, it would allow her that opportunity to have a fixed solution while she was away and we could come back in our leisure to place the, the definitive crown four to six months later. Now, it's a complicated case insofar as the, the patient had missing lateral incisors as a child. Uh, she had her canines moved into the measly into the lateral positions. And she had her first premolars moved into the canine positions. So we've got central incisors, canines in the laterals, first premolars in the canines. She originally had four upper anterior crowns placed many, many years ago, I think 30 years ago on the two centrals and the two canines to give her that two to two nice appearance. About eight years ago, a different dentist decided to veneer the two premolars. So veneering both fours, unfortunately leaving MOD amalgams in both teeth and just doing a labial veneer. What's happened with that is because of the changed emergence profile of the teeth, she's had a changed excursive relationship on them and she actually fractured this tooth in such a way that it was entirely uh, of no of an entirely hopeless prognosis going forward so we can see we've got 30 year old crowns here they were high quality ceramic crowns done 30 years ago uh, these are canines upper left canine upper right canine two central incisors and then we've got these veneered premolars um, I think it was to bring a smile out, uh, act as gatekeepers for her four anteriors and give her a better aesthetic appearance. But I think unfortunately there wasn't proper planning with regard to her uh, excursive relationships in her uh, occlusion. And she ended up doing something rather uh, inappropriate to the tooth. So we've got four anterior crowns and then we've got this veneer on the, on the right side. Um, oops. So, as you can see, it's the mirror shot, and you can see we've got a fractured tooth now. Um, and some dentist that she's been to see as an emergency try to stick it back together with uh, resin reinforced glass animal material, leaving a load on the five as well. Um, but a very unhappy lady at this time, getting ready to go on the holiday of a lifetime, and uh, wanted potentially to have a fixed solution if she could. So preoperatively, uh, we can see the CT scan. And if you look carefully here, you can see with my handy arrow, you can see that we've got this crack going through here. You can see we have got a labial plate intact, um, buccal plate intact, about a millimetre wide. You can see on the palatal route, you can see we've got a small pile of a, 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 a visible. Perhaps up at the apical third of the buccal route, we've got a problem there. 
not so sure about that. Let's see what we see. So looking at a different slice now, we can see the fracture visible here going through one of the canals of the pulp. Really is, the tooth has absolutely had it. What you can see here in your planning is that you've got plenty of interradicular space with some good bone here and here. The bone on the labial is not particularly good here. But, and you've got this very conical, sorry, not conical, you've got this very oval, oval root form. That you need to be aware of because you're not placing an oval implant, you're placing a round cross-section implant. So therefore think about that. You want your round implant to engage mesially and distally to create that primary stability opportunity for you. And again, the inverter, almost ideal for this because you can achieve that, but not have a big fat coronal portion filling this space. So I did a bit of pre-planning. This is my appalling attempt at a drawing here to draw an inverter implant in where I was thinking we're going to place it. So we've got the two roots visible on the uh, premolar that's been made to look sort of like a canine. Um, we've got the flora of the sinus here. And we've got this, my little drawing here of this inverter, which what I was going to try and do is I was going to try and take the inverter into the slightly more mesial position with the long axis of the inverter and, and go a bit higher as well. So we've got a triangle of bone here between the sinus floor and the floor of the nose. And uh, I felt that was appropriate for me to, uh, to have appropriate stability with an inverter implant. So we took the tooth out and the socket was intact. We've got the central uh, uh, interradicular bony septum here that's visible. Um, and you can still see that rubbish all over the five. And then I started degranulating. So again, going back to the degranulation protocol, unfortunately, what I found here on the buccal root, at the tip of the root, there was a granuloma. And the granuloma was connecting with the sinus floor. So this is the first outcome that was perhaps not fully expected prior to the case. And again, this makes you then you have to be aware that when you do implants, when you do an immediate particularly, things happen that you don't expect. So you need to be aware of that. You need to be planned for that. And you need to have opportunities and options available to you at that time. In my view, the key thing here was, could I take this granuloma out? And would it leave the sinus floor schnidarian membrane intact or would it actually create a frank perforation into the sinus? So that was my first sort of mental thought process here. So I carefully removed the granuloma and then I carefully assessed the schnidarian membrane and I found it was intact. I asked her to do a careful Valsalva manoeuvre, direct visualisation, could see that it appeared intact. I used an elephant foot ended probe out of the dust kit actually to just feel that as well it felt intact to me there's still a small chance it wasn't but it felt intact so that then allowed me to think well well what am i going to do with that uh what's my next step here so what i thought was let's let's continue with the inverter i wasn't going to place it down the buckle anyway i was going to be placing it slightly mesial towards the palatal so I was going to try and have the inverter place slightly palatal to the root of the canine. And I was going to try and place it slightly mesial to the long axis of the two roots anyway, to avoid that sinus floor. So for me, it wasn't a deal breaker for me to have this issue with the buccal root uh, apical connection with the sinus. It was a complication, but not a deal breaker. So what I actually did was I used Versa drills. So I used a densification technique, but I didn't use it for densifying that buccal socket. What I did was I used the Versa drills to actually do a little crestal lift into that sinus using alloplast. And the Versa was used very slowly counterclockwise to actually act as a pump to place the ethos material up into the, into the sinus in a controlled way. So that's, that's what I did. I'd already prepped for the inverter and then I did this sinus lift, crestal sinus lift position, um, procedure. But I'm remembering my plotting all the time. So I'm not just 
thinking, well, I've done that now. I'm remembering, I know where my inverter is going to go. I know I've got a repositioned osteotomy here. So I'm happy to still proceed. So I place my inverter. And again, like has become routine. I'm getting ultra high primary stability. And let's just go back here for a brief moment and think about primary stability. High primary stability and people are saying, whoa, carefully got high primary stability. Actually, studies will show us that in trabecular bone, that's crushing trabecular bone and getting high stability is not detrimental in any way. It's not the same as getting ultra high stability with cortical bone and splitting the bone. This is a really planned engineering driven approach to get high stability in trabecular bone and it's predictable and successful. So my inverter's in, my healing abutment's in. I've placed a second tranche of alloplastic material and we're now ready to go forward with the inverter protocol with regard to immediate load again. So here we go, I've taken the healing abutment off and you can see now we've got the wall of the, uh, uh, the ethos uh, alloplast material a bit, uh, visible with the top of it here set. We've got the channel down to the uh, deep conical connection on the inverter implant. And here we go. So happy again, we've got a really nice position for this. We've got this pseudo K9 next to a real K9 and next to a, uh, next to a premolar. And I've got a really nice emergence again. So I've got a lovely, uh, lovely peak cylinder coming out just where I wanted it. Now, at the same time, we've got the provisional crown really covering over most of that alloplast material to protect it in that mesial socket. And here we can see just how challenging this case was. Not only is the ridge not as wide as in other cases, and we're, we're using that 13 times, uh, well actually ended up with, this was a 15 uh, times 5.4 implant, so it's a bigger implant this one. Um, we've still got that really, really nice, appropriate labial plate at the end. So 1.6 millimeters here and room for that endosteum in this critical coronal portion. 1.3 right in the middle in the widest portion of the implant. And then you can see what else I've done here. So I've achieved primary stability by cortically fixating into the floor of the nose. So what I've done here is with the Versa drill, I've also just slightly, slightly, just lifted the floor of the nose slightly. And what I've done there is I've been able to achieve even higher primary stability with the apical portion of my inverter implant. So I'm really happy with that. And you can see again, going back to coaxis, we've been able to achieve screw access just where I wanted it again. Um, and yet keeping this implant within this ridge and keeping this implant within this ridge is not an easy thing, but we managed to do it. So I forgot to show you the crowns. Here it is. Um, nice crown from Phil again. Um, and you can see this nice emergence on your, uh, on your peak cylinder. And there it is after it's been uh, picked up. And here's um, a CT afterwards now showing a few things. So we've got inverter implant position within the bony ridge, slightly, slightly distal, slightly uh, palatal to the uh, canine, the large canine pseudo lateral. We've got this crystal alloplastic sinus lift going on here. And then we've got the position of the second premolar and the sinus floor. So I'm really happy with that. And then when you see a two dimensional x-ray, you can see that I have achieved what I wanted to achieve, which is I've achieved that mesial reposition of that inverter implant, keeping away from that floor of the sinus. At the same time, I've achieved really quite a, a neat, well compacted crestal sinus lift using the alloplastic material. At the same time, doing a ridge preservation procedure on the buccal root of that original first premolar that was masquerading as a canine. And at the same time, we managed to achieve immediate load with high primary stability and a very happy patient. A little bit sad that she'd been ill halfway through the treatment, but she was very, very happy. So thank you. Um, you know, at this time at the moment, all I can say is it's 
it's the time it's an existential crisis the world's going through and um you know it just it, it makes me happy to be able to reflect back that uh, you know i've got such happy memories of placing this amazing implant and I've, I'm absolutely fully convinced that when things calm down, we're going to be back at it again, doing this again. And we live in a great time. We've got, we've got, to me, there's no better implant company than Southern with regard to the support that I get. And I just hope that you found this interesting today and I'd be delighted to answer any questions that you might have. Hopefully you'll have some. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Don. I've, I do have some questions here that was asked over the course of the um, of your lecture. Super. Uh, the first is, how deep do you place the inverter, as deep as any other internal connection? I tend to place them three to four millimetres subcrestal. So that's as deep as I place. Um, I don't... I don't... Uh, if I'm doing an immediate placement, um, I tend to usually place the implant between one and three millimeters subcrestal, but within inverter, it's about three, three to four. And that's what I commonly do. And it's uh, achieving the, the three things, which are 3D correct positioning, remembering that you've got a coaxis connection the vast majority of times I have. And so therefore ensuring that I've got the rotational position correct. And I've also got the depth of the implant correct to allow me to have that really juicy, endosteal bone preservation in the key labial and in the mesial distal positions around the implant. Thank you. The next question, I think you have alluded to this in your fifth case, but how does the inverter compare to, let's say, any straight implant, but then with an angled abutment? Will the soft tissue repair not look the same? Well, it's, it's not really so much as the soft tissue repair will, will look the same. It's the fact that you you're achieving something far simpler. An angled abutment's all very well, but if you've got an angled abutment and you've had to go cement retained because you're wanting to use a traditional normal screw, then you've got the advantage of using your normal strong screw, so you're not using a silly angle correction screw. But you've got the disadvantage that you're then going cement retained. Now, you could say that I could use a custom angled abutment and I can get my cement finish line in an appropriate position just in the crest, just in the uh, sulcus. So therefore I'm not having cement ejection going down near the head of the implant. However, there's some studies suggest that even when you have your cement finish line up high like that, away, well away from your implant, you can get hydrostatic forces creating an implant, creating that cement going around the corner and going down the abutment, down the conical fluted portion of the abutment. And so for me, if I can avoid cement retained, that's what I want to do. If I can avoid an angle correction screw, that's what I want to do. The reason for that is primarily a couple of things. It's quite an, it's an interesting engineering solution. So it's not something that's without merit. However, by its very nature, you've got a, a ball ended, a rose ended uh, angle correction screwdriver, and it's connecting with that screw head with less surface contact area than a traditional hex connection. And due to that, when you try to load that screw, it's very likely, or it's a little more likely rather, that you can strip the screw or you can damage the connection so that it's difficult or impossible to retrieve the screw. The third thing is that you can achieve a lower primary, you can achieve a lower insertion torque with the screw. So rather than the traditional Southern screw, where you can go up to 40 Newton centimeters if you need to, you're often, uh, prohibitive, prohibited to go above 20. And for me, I prefer not to go to 20 if possible when I'm, when I'm doing a, um, a crown, I want to be higher than that. So for me, having the ability to angle connect correct within the implant and for it to be an engineering based angle correction. So during, due to the way the implants loaded, we've got areas of metal compression where we've got the thinner portion of the implant coronal portion and we've got a uh, metal um, torque tension in the really thick portion of the uh, of the coronal portion of the implant you really have got an engineering based logical solution here and for me it makes perfect sense so that's why i do it and that's why i use it i hope that answered the question 
Great, thank you. Um, what's the alloplast material that you used? Uh, well, I use uh, a material called Ethos. Um, it, it's a beta tricalcium phosphate with a calcium sulfate. So the beta tricalcium phosphate is biphasic, which means it's two different phases of the material. And it's then got calcium sulfate as a binding material. And it's mixed with 0.9% uh, saline. And it's uh, what you tend to find then is the calcium sulfate sets and forms a pseudomembrane. So the material sets, key, the key issue, the key thing is that you don't need to use a membrane with it. It forms its own pseudomembrane. And I found it very successful for me. And uh, I've been using it a long time. And I've been using beta tricalcium phosphate materials for longer than ethos as well. I've been using Fortis Vital and others beforehand and found it to be predictable and successful in my hands. And it formed the ideal partner really with the inverter for these cases. Right, thank you. Um, could you have shielded the incisive canal with collagen membrane? I'm not sure which case this refers to. This is the second case of the case theories today. And I could, um, but uh, why? Uh, collagen membranes is another option. Um, for me, it had been potentially quite fiddly to do that. Um, and I'm not sure that I would have been had a predictable um, conversion to host bone. The thing that I'm pretty sure with ethos is that I'm going to get a conversion to host bone. So that's why I used it. And I felt that it, because it's a particulate material, I was able to place it in a really accurate way. Um, and I was less concerned about, for example, a collagen membrane shifting and uh, not being, uh, not occluding that gap in the appropriate way. So for me, there was no need to do that. And because there's no, I didn't feel that there was any uh, prejudice from having the alloplast indirect connection with the nerve and vascular bundle within the incisive foramen at all. Okay. Thank you. Um, then two questions about the RPM that you run the degranulation burr at. Yeah. Uh, I tend to use it uh, dependent on what I'm doing, but it's between 400 and 700 RPM. I tend to use it at a lot of water and I use it a light stroking stroke. So I'm not pressing hard on it and trying to use it as a drill. I'm using it as a degranulation piece of equipment. So therefore stroking across the surface of the bone and you'll find it will degranulate very effectively like that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Don, when you're placing your ethos, do you do this before or after modifying your temporary? If after, how do you avoid getting your pickup material incorporated with your alloplast? That, well, that's, it's fairly simple. The alloplast forms a pseudomembrane, so therefore when I do it, and I do do it, place it before. So you'll notice from the slides that I place the alloplast with a healing abutment, take the healing abutment off when the alloplast has formed its pseudomembrane, when it's set, and then I can place my provisional crown, use the composite within that, and I don't get composite picking up the uh, alloplast at all. So that kind of testament to the ability of the material to form nice a nice set structure. So, you know, don't rush it. Don't try and place your immediate temporary provisional and start filling it with composite 30 seconds after placing your alloplast. Wait for it to set, take a breath, revisit the case when it's set, and then you should find you have no issues. I don't feel the need to be able to, to use a little bit of rubber dam or any other form of barrier technique to avoid penetration of my alloplast with composite. I don't find that's an issue. Thank you. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, thank you, Dr. Huli. For case four, what's the greatest width of the inverter close to the adjacent teeth during placement? Has this width been an issue at all? No, it's not been an issue because of pre-planning. Um, you know, you've got to be aware of the fact that you're using an implant. It's a tapered implant like other tapered implants and it has a maximum uh, width, the maximum width is in a different position than it may than it would be in a traditional conical tapered form implant. So you've got to be aware of that, and you've got to plan for that. What you don't want to do is be stroking the the walls of the teeth on either side. So therefore, it's important to take a preoperative CT scan 
Code names two t, and measure the distance and make sure that you've got adequate distance. On the other hand, there are cases where you've got a minimal amount of distance and you've got to make that judgment on the day. For me, um, you know, if, if we're looking at a situation where it's a lower incisor and we've got a we've got a narrow space, then you're going to end up using a different type of implant. You're not just going to fall back on an inverter for every single case of your life. What I'm saying here is that the inverter, if the case is appropriate, is an amazing implant and it can do so much, but you've still got to be aware you've got to pre-plan carefully and use it within the parameters that you feel comfortable to use it with. I'm somebody who does push the barriers a little bit uh, and that's done with full consent of my patients and the fact that I've been doing it a long time. So I hope that, I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, another one, I don't use ethos, but was wondering how easy it is to get it to sit in a flawless, flatless procedure. I understand it needs to be dry to sit. Well, that's, that's uh, part of the, you know, I don't, don't want this uh, webinar to be too much on this, but one, one thing I would say is really important is that it's like any other, any other material you use for bone regeneration. You want to, you want to, it's got a learning curve and it's got the, the learning curve isn't steeper than other materials. It's just a learning curve and you need to make, make sure you're happy with it. And therefore there's, there's little elements of finesse that you learn with the material. So for example, you learn how much moisture you remove from the material before you place it. Do you want a dry mix? Do you want a medium mix? Do you want a wet mix? You want to understand what it looks and feels like when it has been dried with gauze. So you, you make sure that when you're using this material, you've got sterile gauze available. And then that allows you to actually dry the material in situ when it's in place within the socket jump gap. And it allows you then to, to know when it's set. And as I say, it's not, it's not something I found practically difficult I think what you've got to be very careful of, and I think this is a learning curve, is you don't want it a very, very dry, and you don't want to compact it as vigorously as you can into the into the socket. I think that the whole benefit of nearly any material is that you use it judiciously and you use it so that it's not hyper compacted to allow for that revascularization and, and new bone formation. So therefore. I think it's a simple material to use, but that doesn't mean it's easy. That means that you have to be aware that you, you have a learning curve and you need to ensure that you feel comfortable and confident and take a stepwise approach. So don't start with the world's hardest case. Start with a case you feel very comfortable and confident with and gradually expand your parameters as you gain confidence with the material. And that's, that applies with the implant as well. With an inverter implant, make sure first that you're au okay fait with coaxis and you understand the principle and you, you, you feel confident. And then I think it's appropriate to think inverter, an implant for an experienced dentist, but at the same time, an absolutely fabulous implant. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got a hand raised, so I'm going to allow um, Dr. Andrew Norman to talk. Oh, of course. Okay. Hello. Andrew, please unmute yourself. Hi. Hi. Hello there. Hi, uh, Dom. Um, I was just uh, asking the question about the, um, the depth to which you place. If you're placing in a immediate ridge, you said you'd, yeah. you'd bury it. You said you'd bury it um, one to two mils, I think you said. If you're if you're placing in a ridge which is uh, intact, which you're not taking a, a tooth out from, do you bury it further or do you leave it kind of crystal? No, I mean if I can go back to that, I think when I'm placing in a socket, it's three to four millimeters. Right. Okay. So three to four millimeters on average. Um, I wouldn't want to be less. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be less than two millimeters. Um, the implant itself, I mean, it's it's an ideal implant. Implant. Uh, one one of the things that I haven't used it for today, but some of my colleagues are using it for. Um, Guy um, uh, is using it uh, for uh, immediate full, full arch as he's risen. These guys, they're doing it in healed ridges. Um, and 
what you tend to find there is that you, you, you still need to be placing this implant about two millimeters subcrestal. You don't want to be placing this implant on the crest. And that's not for this implant. That's for most implants these days. Remember, you've got various different connection options with this implant. You've got the uh, deep conical connection, which I tend to use. And you've got an external axe connection as well. For me, with the deep conical, you've got the advantage of getting that really good seal between the abutment and your implant, but you still want to be placing the implant a couple of millimeters sub subcrestal. I hope that helps, Andrew. Okay, great, thanks, mate. <clears throat> okay, um, and Dom, this is the last question um, I'm going to take for this afternoon. Okay. Um, it's someone who's saying it's good to hear that Yorkshire accent again. I was still treated <laughs> by a Yorkshireman. Fantastic presentation, Dom, and great results with Inverta. I've used Coaxis for the last 17 years. This is Greg yeah. Bordali. And I've used and still use external hex. What are your thoughts about internal versus external hex for Inverta? Um, well, I think as I alluded to during the actual uh, presentation, I think as we move towards expanded roles for Inverta, and we're looking at narrow inverters perhaps going forward in the future for, for narrower spaces, then I think external hex has a very clear engineering advantage with regard to the, the amount of material in, the, uh, in that coronal portion of the implant for strength. So I think that's an immediate advantage. Um, I think external hex as well, um, I think it's a fallacy to say that external hex implants uh, lose burn around them. I think it's, it's, it's not true. And I think, again, it's uh, with the passive abutment, I think an external hex implant's uh, uh, a good option. Um, for me, my own personal implant practice has been more, over the years, based around an internal connection. So though I do use external hex implants, um, various, various types, but particularly the southern ones, um, my main practice is based around the internal conical connection. And one of the advantages of the deep conical connection is that really you're achieving that really almost Morse taper type connection between the, uh, the internal portion of the implant and the, uh, and the abutment and limiting the amount of micro movement that you get. Um, and it works for me. So that's, that's really my views on it. I don't think I'm the ideal person to ask with regard to external hex on inverter, with regard to my own personal experience of using it in that way, or using that type of implant. Right. Thank you so much for your time, Dom. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, have a good day further. Bye. Thanks very much, Liesl. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.